we uh, stays in a play. So people will get often that, ah, this, this lady is referring to her husband by name. So we have to take certain liberties and adapt it to our local culture. I think uh, uh, as writers, we all have a responsibility, so to say, to let people know about the culture of the place. But besides that, I also think that there has always been a very rich culture and sort of heritage of writing itself in certain parts of the Northeast. Uh, and I think translation is probably a way for us to let others also know that there are these kind of writers as well. A lot of writing happens in vernacular languages and people do not know about most of them. Uh, yeah, so translation, yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is not about translation. It's actually, um, all of you come from different states, uh, speak uh, different languages, many languages, and probably have different sensibilities. And I was curious to know what uh, you feel about being slotted as writers from the Northeast and about writing from the Northeast. And do you think that you're expected to write a certain kind of narrative in terms of content and uh, style when, uh, you know, people talk about grouping uh, writing and writers from the Northeast. Thank you. There are 420 dialects or languages from the Northeast, it seems, the so-called Northeast. So, uh, definitely a lot of diversity. You want to answer that? Actually, yeah. it's right. We've kind of uh, veered onto a translation when the workshop is actually, a, uh, talk is actually about writings from the Northeast. And I was just chatting with Partho as we came in, and uh, there's this big debate about this label Northeast, um, especially writer from the Northeast. Yesterday we had a session on young Indian woman writers. So we were talking about labels. Do I want to be known as an Indian writer, woman writer, then writer from Northeast? How many labels do I honor, you know? So um, I have mixed feelings. I say something controversial in public. I've said it in print also. There is in the Northeast quite a strong reaction when you say, he or she is a writer from the Northeast, they immediately take umbrage and say, but don't say that. I mean, I'm a writer after all. Don't say, don't uh, limit me to being from the Northeast. I have a different uh, spin on it. I look at it a little more pragmatically in that um, the Northeast, face it, is on the margins. We are uh, physically far away. We have been emotionally far away from Delhi. And um, within that region, although we are so different, as Dia pointed out, so many different dialects and states, so many languages, so many very different sensibilities and very different histories and legacies, Yet, there is also something invisible which uh, we do share in common away from other states. We, number one, have that sense of distance. We, number one, share a sense of isolation sometimes, a strong sense of being on the margins. We also sh uh, are uh, actually physically at the interface of Southeast Asia and the subcontinent. I've always said that. So there are strong influences coming in from um, South of Southeast of Asia, which a lot of people don't know the history, geography of it very well, but there are distinct, uh, having lived there, for example, um, uh, Manipur. I mean, the, the Burmese kings, astrologers, were always Manipuri astrologers. They always took astrologers from Manipur to um, soothsay for them in Yangon, in the old Rangoon. Um, we have strong ties. There are, there are Naga villages, uh, the line, you know, the previous session when he said, my lychee gach stayed, are, are in, uh, stayed in India. I've lost my fruit trees to India. So there are lines running through Naga villages. So cousins are on one side and on the other side. Mizo villages. They're called Zomis in um, Burma, but they are called Mizos in India. So uh, I had the privilege of visiting Burma, and I found to my horror that the mekhala I'm wearing, I find the same mekhala on the street of Yangon, and I asked the girl, where'd you buy? She said, that shop there. The same booties, which I don't see in the rest of India, but I see in a Yangon. So there are very strong uh, cultural links, and that, again, ties us uh, through together in the Northeast. So there are invisible ties, there are great divides, there are great enmities and wars also within the Northeast, yet there are divides. And now when you face, face up a common wall, when you face, up, face, to the, face the rest of the world, you kind of are linked together as Northeast. And I look at it very practically. I look at it as um, we, have, we are kind of smaller, I won't say weaker, we have been a little, a little invisible. But of late, there has been a great interest in writings from the Northeast. We've always had a very strong vernacular tradition, as we all pointed out, and acknowledge and respect. But we have also have uh, this great tradition of writing in English. So Northeast Writers Forum, I heard Bijoda saying we're trying to encourage people from other languages to join. But the actual central idea in 97, when we started it, when it started, uh, was to band together writers in English because every vernacular language has always had a forum. Very strong bodies, very strong patronage, very strong scholarships, uh, awards. But writers in English have been by and large neglected. So we started this, this organization was started to promote writings in English. Then we realized, again, a commonality that so many people write in English in the Northeast. Uh, maybe because of the influence of the church, a lot of the hilly states are, you know, do speak in English more regularly. They write in English, think in English. So 
Yes, exactly. So, um, we, um, you know, so when you say from the northeast, um, uh, the writings came about and people took notice. Menguin, um, they are sitting right there, has this section called the North Jewels from the Northeast. There's so many novels published in English uh, from the northeast. So. Um, there is a, uh, an interest in this uh, umbrella thing called the Northeast um, writings, the writers in the Northeast. And I feel practically that um, right now, let's be under the umbrella. I don't take great offense at being called a writer from the Northeast. Because if that means there's an interest, because as a body, we there's a thrust and people are looking at us, let them look at us now as writers from the Northeast. But let me tell you, maybe that's how they looked at Russian fiction when it started. Maybe that's how they looked at American literature when it started. But there will come a time when writing will mature, fiction will mature. And no one is going to publish somebody just because he's a writer from the Northeast. At that point, they're going to say this is a good book or a bad book. This is good literature or bad literature. So that stage of maturity will come. But I'm, I tell younger writers who um, take political offense at being called a writer from the Northeast, I say, hey, I mean, fine. I mean, bear with it if you feel strongly. But uh, there will come a time when you will be your own writer. Um, I don't really see great damage coming from this umbrella. But I'm sure there are others might differ. On this I think uh, it's because of the umbrella that you know, uh, this festival itself has got all of us here in a way. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, so it's good. I, I like your practical approach to the whole thing. Any uh, difference of opinion on that? I don't know if it's a difference, but uh, everyone has to come from somewhere, I think, in the end, no? So, again, you would go out, uh, say you're traveling somewhere in uh, South Africa and someone asks you, uh, are you an Indian now? You're not going to say and like actually, you know, like we are Indian, but like the Indians don't really like us and you're from that corner and then, you know, from this uh, kind of thing. You don't really. Now, if you really want to generalize and get all, then okay, then you just say, no, man, I'm from planet Earth. You know, it's done. Like, no, that's uh, because that's where in the end you take a logical thing. You have to belong somewhere. Someone calls you. You don't like it. You choose another name. You don't like it. You know, so, okay. Historically, the Shudra, the Shudra didn't like it. Then again, Harijan came, and that itself was children of God. But then it becomes a pejorative because it's not in the name, it's in the thought that uh, <coughs> what it ends up connoting. So there's also a thing some writers don't like being called the Siliguri Corridor, being called Chicken Neck, because again, uh, it uh, brings uh, forth unsavory images. But it is a neck, and someone call it a neck, you know, so Chicken Neck. So why? I mean, like, you know, it's, you take umbrage at everything and, uh, I don't know, you won't have many friends left, huh? that's uh, probably that as well. Yes. Uh, but uh, as writers from the Northeast, do you feel some sort of a pressure to write about the Northeast? I mean, like, your fiction is mostly about the Northeast, but then suddenly, say, some writer from the Northeast writes about a Tamil family and someone says, there is no Northeast in this. And so, like, do you feel some sort of a pressure in writing about uh, what, uh, where you are from? No, actually, I have said at the beginning itself. So I write for myself only. I don't write it con consciously that I should write for uh, for the northeast. I write what I know. I have written many short stories based on uh, Manipur. Then I have written many more stories based elsewhere. So there is no compulsion or nothing. It comes automatically. Whatever strikes my mind, I write. There is nothing <laughs> uh, which compels me to write from the uh, notice. I write what I know and I, the thing, it may be through media, I, uh, direct experience or through my, through books or there are so many channels through which I can learn. If anything strikes my mind, then I'll write. There's no compulsion that I should write for the notice only. That, that is not there. Sorry, that was the second part of Dia's question, which I missed, in that do you feel compelled to write about something? And do people compel you? Do publishers expect you to write about something? So I think the key word is, I write what I know, is what Bijoy Das said. So when I write about uh, Shilong or Gohati or um, about things in Dibrugar, it's because that's what I know best. And um, I think writers, um, um, you know, they keep, they, they, this is a joke about you, get your autobiography out of the way in the beginning. So I think when we do start, we do start with things we know best. We feel safe. And then we venture out. So it's not a consciously I'm writing because I'm from the Northeast. I write about the Northeast. I've lived 20 years away. I've lived more than my half, uh, half my life outside Assam, actually. But uh, it is true. Those are the deeper emotions, the connections to your childhood holidays, uh, the mango your grandfather cut for you, are very deep-rooted memories. So we will begin to write about what we know best and then venture forth. But uh, it's not a conscious that I'm writing about a Delhi or a Bombay or about an Assam or a Shillong. And um, I think to give credit to publishers, there's never been pressure. For example, I have sometimes been um, 
obliquely asked that, you know, you don't write too much about the insurgency because like yeah. writings about unrest, we didn't address it deeply enough. I think we went on to translation. But people do expect from the Northeast write, uh, writings about unrest, about insurgency, counter insurgency, about conflict, about death and drama. But you know when you're living there, so people say, why do you write your, your, your works are more domestic, they're more um, placid, how come? Because really when you're living in a Guwahati or a Shillong, there is unrest lapping at the edges, yes, but you're not in the thick of it. In our middle class lives, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we're not in the thick of it. Unrest does come to your door, some of your cousins do get kidnapped, somebody you do know does get killed, but that's not a day-to-day -day happening. It's as bad as a, a decorative in Delhi or in um, mm -hmm. Gorakhpur, mm -hmm. you know? So. I write, we write our fiction um, in the way it really is, and we write about uh, the insurgency or about uh, militancy in as much as it affects us in our daily life, in as much as it affects the protagonist in that piece of fiction. So, uh, but yes, I think from Northeast, sometimes people do wonder, why don't you write about the insurgency? I said, um, well, I'm writing about human relationships, middle class life, um, hopes, desires, longings, and there is somebody who wants to write this big drama about, um, uh, you know, um, militancy, and he's doing it, but that's not what I want to write about, so that's why I'm not writing about it. There is no pressure, but there is a question mark sometimes, a sense of wonder, and we deal with it, I think. Yeah, it's also, I think it's uh, about finding, uh, what they say, uh, some skin to put your soul in, no? It's a setting, yeah? It could be, it's, uh, and the setting you know best, you're going to use that. Uh, from Janvi's uh, collection, first one yeah there's a story called the favorite child in which a girl comes back and then they are four sisters and they have a lot of tension and uh, she comes back and uh, her mom's i think about to pass away or she just passed away you take that story anywhere in the world yeah? and it's all about the insecurities of a child vis-a-vis -vis the parents well it's set in uh, the northeast but you take it anywhere in the world and because it's such a resounding human uh, kind of insecurity or a human condition it will gain, it will find uh, credence anywhere in the world. So it's, you're rooted there, so you write about what you know. Uh, there's one guy, I think, in Sikkim who just published a book, uh, self-published, and uh, he's a footballer, so he published a book about uh, a footballer in Brazil who is uh, facing some problems with his club. And uh, he doesn't know Portuguese, uh, he's never been to Brazil. And he wrote quite a book, yeah, so I don't know how he did it. Um, when I ask him next, I'll ask him. But the rest of us, I think, while we can, we'll have to uh, make do it where we are, I think. Yeah, I think I'd like to carry on this discussion with you. Uh, it's so engaging, uh, offline probably. I think we're running short of time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Raj, uh, Janabi, and Vijayda. Uh, uh, and, and this is, you know, one topic which you can just go on and on, but... Uh, uh, some other time, yeah, yeah. So please uh, go to the Naughty, see that it's one of the most beautiful parts of India. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a very enriching session, I think, is the word that can be best used to describe it. Uh, the next session will talk about riches of another kind. Um, and then we'll talk about a story that has captivated our attention in recent times, as few NRI stories have done. The story of Rajat Gupta, who went from great riches to great rags. And the title of the session is From Icon to Con Man. Anita Raghavan and Shondi Pandeb in conversation with Josh Sen. Josh, would you like to come up and prove that you're there, since I can't see the other two? 